Welcome back. Today, we are going to discuss a classic prisoner's dilemma problem known as the roommate's dilemma. There are two roommates, say Frankie, she, and Gary, he, who really like coffee, and, I am co and they are considering getting an, a fancy espresso machine that they would share between the two of them in their apartment as a public good. Now, this is an expensive machine. It costs $1,000, and then it, it's a big decision to make. They need to decide two things. They need to decide first whether they are going to buy the machine or not. And if they do end up buying the machine, they need to decide how much each of them is going to pay. Let TF denote the amount of money that Frankie would pay and TG the amount of money that Gary would pay. If they buy the machine, then the, these two numbers need to add up to $1,000 to cover the entire cost of the machine. Let's set up some ground rules. First of all, let's assume that the machine has no resale value. So they're going to use it for a few years and then they're going to throw it away. Secondly, let's assume that there's no maintenance and there's no cleaning the machine. So you couldn't say whoever pays less uh, has to clean the machine or something like that. Likewise, there's no way of restricting use. So you couldn't say if you want to use it more, you have to pay more. In fact, the use and the maintenance cannot be monitored at all. Before proceeding to the rest of the video, I would like you to take a minute to think about how you and your roommate would solve this problem. So please, if you haven't read the lecture notes yet, pause the video and try to come up with a mechanism that is with a set of rules that you might use in real life. Once you do that, you may resume the video once more. Last time I taught this class, I asked students to propose mechanisms during the live lecture, and these are some of the ideas they came up with. First of all, the most common one was, the, was a 50-50 split. If both roommates agree to pay for half the cost of the machine, they should buy it and pay 500 each, otherwise they should not buy it. There are other ideas that, that were proposed. For example, people thought, well, if somebody values the machine more, um, that person could pay more. Of course, because we don't allow for monitoring, this would have to be based on, on past use. So whoever drinks more coffee or whoever expects to drink more coffee um, or whoever likes coffee more, um, could, could pay more. You could think of other kind of mechanisms, maybe one of the roommates buys the machine and the other roommate compensates him or her a certain amount. Maybe you can think of a mechanisms where the roommate alternate making offers or do some sort of bargaining, trying to figure out how much they're willing to pay and, uh, and so on and so forth. So the point of this exercise is to get you to see that there are many different ways to make this decision, many different mechanisms, and then that begs the question of which mechanisms are better. We're going to focus on a slightly easier question, which is whether we can at least find one good mechanism. And by good, we're going to mean one mechanism that achieves a Pareto efficient outcome, no matter what. In order to do so, let's make a couple of assumptions. Uh, first, let's assume that people's utility is equal to some number so that, that measures the utility that they get from using the machine. Let's call it the value minus the amount of money that they pay. Uh, we could in principle allow the amount of money that one roommate pays to be negative as long as the total amount that they pay equals to 1,000. So this would mean, for example, that one roommate is going to pay the other roommate for the right to have the espresso machine in the apartment, which I guess it's, it's fine in principle. Uh, one thing we are not going to allow for now, just for simplicity, we will allow for this later on, is what's called for money burning which would mean that, um, that, that the roommates throw money away. It could be, for example, that they buy the machine and they pay more than $1,000 to, to the person selling this machine. Or it could be, for example, that, um, that they don't buy the machine and they just put some amount of money in the trash. So we are not allowing for money burning today. The nice thing about working with quasilinear utility is that, as you may remember from the first part of the course, Pareto efficiency is equivalent to the utilitarian criteria. So in order to find efficient outcomes, what we need to do is we need to add up the utility of both individuals. If they do not buy the machine, then their utility is add up to zero. If they buy up the machine, then the sum of their utilities equals the sum of the value that they get from using the machine minus the $1,000 that they paid between the two of them. So, the Pareto efficient outcome is to buy the machine if and only if 
the sum of the values of the two roommates is at least equal to $1,000 or more. Let's try to see this in a graph. This is a graph we haven't seen before, but it's a graph that we're going to be using a lot for this last part of the course. Uh, we're going to have two axes. In the vertical axis, we're going to draw the value of one of the roommates, say Frankie, and on the vertical axis, we're going to have the value of the other room. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to, to draw the line that goes from 0, 1000 to 1000, 0, because that line is going to correspond to the equation value of Frankie plus value of Gary is exactly equal to, to 1000. Um, to 1000. Now, our criterion for, for efficiency is that if we are above that line, that is, if the sum of the two values is more than 1000, we would like to buy the machine. And if we are below that line, that is, if the value, if the sum of the two values is less than 1000, we would like to not buy the machine. So the Pareto efficient outcome, it's going to be to buy in the blue region and to not buy in the red region in this graph. All right, so let's start by analyzing a mechanism that is going to be efficient by construction. The mechanism is going to start with Frankie announcing a number. And we, I want you to think about it as, as, as him announcing truthfully what, what his uh, true valuation is. So you can think about this as, as playing the same role as a bid played in, in, in an auction. All right, so if the number that he announces is greater than 1,000, well, then it's sufficient to buy and we could have him just pay for the entire price of the machine. Otherwise, we're going to ask Gary to announce a number. Um, how much, and again, he's supposed to report how much he values the machine. If the sum of the two announcements, which are supposed to be equal to the two values, is greater than 1,000, then we're going to buy the machine and uh, Frankie will pay his willingness to pay and Gary will pay the rest. Otherwise, we don't buy the machine. So, if both roommates report truthfully, then this mechanism is efficient by construction. The problem is that that might be a big if. In reality, probably only Frankie knows exactly how much he's willing to pay the for the machine, and only Gary knows exactly how much he's willing to pay for the machine. That is, the, the, the roommate's valuations of the machine is private information. And the mechanism only works well if, um, if the roommates report truthfully. For that to be the case, they need to have the incentives to actually tell the truth. So let's think about the incentives that the mechanism generates, and let's do that with some specific numbers. So suppose that Frankie's valuation is 1200, and Gary's valuation is 750, so it's sufficient to buy the machine. But these numbers are private information. Each roommate knows their own valuation, but not exactly the valuation of the other one. Suppose, however, that Frankie knows that Gary values the machine at least 300. If she were to report truthfully, she would say that her value is 1200, which is more than 1000, and she would pay for the entire cost of the machine. If she underreported and say, for example, 700, then Gary would say 300 uh, or more, so Frankie would end up paying only 700. In both cases, that would buy the machine, but in the later case, Frankie would pay less. That means that um, Frankie has incentives to lie. When that happens, we say that the mechanism is not incentive compatible. While it promises to deliver the efficient outcome in theory, in practice, it might not perform that well. So let us consider a different mechanism, a mechanism that is going to be incentive compatible. This is the 50-50 split mechanism, which at least um, when I taught the course last time, it was the, the mechanism that most people thought thought of first. Okay, so according to this mechanism, Frank is going to report not his value, he's just going to report, um, uh, he's just going to say whether his value is greater than 500 or not. You may not have seen the notation that I'm using in this slide before. So this double stroke one, um, it's sometimes used to denote a function called the indicator function, which takes as an input a sentence, in this case, whether the value is greater than equal to 100, and it returns 1 if the sentence is true, and 0 if the sentence is false. So uh, Frankie would say 1 if his value is greater than 500, and 0 otherwise. Then Gary would do the same. Gary would say ag equal to 1 if his value is greater than 500, and, um, and 0 otherwise. And then if both of them say 1, we're going to buy the machine, each of them pays half of it, 
If at least one of them says no, then we don't buy the machine. It is relatively easy to see that in this 50-50 split mechanism, it's weakly dominant to report truthfully. Uh, to do that, I'm going to draw this payoff table where I am only drawing the payoffs of the row player. And notice that if the row player value is greater than 500, then it is weakly dominant to say yes, and uh, if it's less than 500, then it is weakly dominant to say, to say no. Therefore, the mechanism is weakly dominant incentive compatible. The remaining question is how does this 50-50 split mechanism do in terms of efficiency? And for that purpose, let's go back and, and do a similar graph to the one we did before. Again, in one axis, in each of the two axes, we're going to have the value of each of the two roommates. Now, Gary is going to say yes when his value is greater than 500. So if we draw this horizontal line uh, where, where, 500, where the value 500 is for Gary, he's going to say yes above this line and he's going to say no below this line. Similarly, Gary is going to say yes to the right of his 500, um, of, his, of the line where his value is equal to 500 and no to the left, which means that the roommates are going to end up buying in this upper right corner. And the good news is that whenever they buy, they are above the, the, the line, the efficiency line, so it is always efficient to do so. Also, if we are below the efficiency line, then it has to be the case that um, at least one of the value of the two roommates is less than 500, so none of the two roommates are going to buy. The problem happens in this gray area. Suppose, for example, that Gary's value is 200 and Frankie's value is 1200 then it is sufficient to buy because the sum of the values is 1400. However, because Gary says no, the roommates would not buy and the mechanism would thus be inefficient. The same would be true, for example, if uh, Gary's value was 900 and Frankie's value was 300. In that case, the mechanism would end up with the roommates not buying the machine. However, and therefore the utilities would be zero. However, if they were to buy the machine and pay, for example, uh, Frankie could pay 250, Gary would pay 750, they would have a strictly positive utility because the amount that they're paying is less than their value, they're, so Gary would get a utility of 150 and Frankie would get a utility of 150, and therefore buying the machine with those, with those uh, payments would be a Pareto improvement relative to not buying. So the mechanism is delivering an outcome which is Pareto dominated. So let's wrap up. Where does that leave us? We found a mechanism which was efficient but not incentive compatible, and then we thought of a second mechanism which was incentive compatible but not efficient. So the question remains, can we find at least one mechanism that is going to be efficient and incentive compatible? And that's the question we're going to try to address in the remainder of this course. Next video we'll move away from the roommate problem and talk about general mechanism design settings. See you next time.